Fáil sé rúf, onna hiláin, you're all welcome from the islands. It's good to see you. Now, I suppose I've always found that the big policy issues are relatively easy. Delivery is always our problem. And I'd like to reference some of the issues raised. Housing is a big issue on the islands. There's no question or doubt about that. My view is we need a bank of land in each island for social, affordable and other permanent housing. Because there are people moving into islands, they can't get a site, and if they get a site, they can't get planning permission. Uh, and I believe we have to tackle that issue nationally. I was disappointed it wasn't tackled more comprehensively in the islands plan. The second thing is, a positive one, is the Creek Konoha, because the Creek Konoha means that if there is a derelict house, and if you do it up, for permanent dwelling, it cannot be done up as a holiday home, there's up to €90,000 available, plus the SAI grants. So I think we should note that, because that is a step in the right direction, because it stops them all being sold off, as they are at the moment, as holiday homes, or at least it gives you a competitive advantage in the market. Uh, just as a matter of interest, if you get planning permission in Galway for a house on a, on a family need basis or a housing need basis, there's an inurement put in that for seven years that you must have resided in that house for seven years. And if you sell it, the person who gets it has to have resided in it for seven years before you can sell it on the open market. So you can't build a house and then say, ha I didn't really want this for a house. Uh, and I think that's something very positive, and I've always supported that policy. Um, modern sanitation. My belief on the islands is, as I think all my island friends know, is that the island fund should make a contribution towards this, because if you're waiting for Irish water to do it on the basis of population, you'll always be at the bottom of the queue because of the very dispersed small populations and inaccessibility and cost prices. Um, and therefore, I believe that we need to just bump up the island fund and get the Department of the Islands to negotiate to deliver on water and sanitation. We can talk about all the policies we want. The question is, how are you going to deliver? Uh, Simon and Tude, you're absolutely right. There should be facility for second-level education. I think you know the problem we're hitting up against. It should be linked into the local school. And we have to get a synergy between the local school and the island. Because the, the students, as they grow up, will want to be able to access some things in the local school, with the facilities they have and so on. And on the other hand, should be getting other parts of their education on the island. And it could be all hybrid. It could be two days a week, three days a week. It could be summer terms, winter term. There's different things you can do in different places. Uh, it, some of it will be distance education. But the distance education should be to the local, the nearest school possible, because then they could in person attend. For example, if you're doing physics, you could do all the theory online, but you'd have to do the practicals in the laboratories. Um, what I find a lot of these things, the big policy is right, but we need to get all the players locally to, to buy in. Uh, on the freight issue, Simon, I'm aware of the problem. The freight prices should be negotiated um, when the contract comes up. And the Islanders should insist on getting it totally revised from A to Z. Um, again, that issue we've discussed, but it does need to happen. Uh, you see, what actually happened was that in Inish Moore, the freight prices were brought down two thirds from what they used to be historically. So they were very happy. There are anomalies in the price list, and I think we need to tackle that. And I think it is very, very tactable, because the department should exceed when the new contract's coming up, that the freight prices give you the benefit of the subsidy. Um, rural Ireland and sustainable goals, and this is particularly relevant to islands, but it's also relevant to the mainland. There's two ways of trying to solve a problem. One is to move all the people into the cities, but we know the problem that gives us. And anyway, you'll have a residual population in the country, so you'll still have to run all your electric ca cables and so on, and you'll still have to provide the services. Much more rational, of course, is to keep viable rural communities and decarbonize the community. And as somebody living in a rural area, and I have already got solar panels for my water, but my intention is to put solar panels in for my electricity. 
So not only will I be producing my own, but I'll export any surplus. Also, in time, when to become a reasonable value, to get an EV car. Now, at this stage, you begin to run thin in the argument against it, except lots of people don't like rural houses, but that's their tough look. As far as I'm concerned, that's a democratic debate we have to have for those who are for or those who are against, but that, I don't think sustainability is necessary. Because in other ways, social sustainability in rural communities is extraordinarily good. Achievement of young people growing up tends to be very, very high. And therefore, if we're talking about total sustainability, I think we have to consider issues other than just pure carbon, because carbon is eliminatable by technology. And I'm a great believer in technology. As I said in relation to the broadband, and this goes back to the technology again, coming to the people rather than the people going to the technology, uh, my guess is that these digital hubs will be relatively little used within five years, except by those who visit our areas. That the vast majority of rural people with digital access, as I do at home, I'm lucky, I, I think of 60 meg um, fibre to the box. Um, and an awful lot of my neighbours, some of them, it's, there's a massive digital divide within most rural communities. Uh, 100 houses have fibre. About 20 houses are like me, fibre to the box. And then there's about 200 houses who are dependent on mobile systems. But the one great thing is, and it would be great to get the update, and there's been a little bit of slippage, but by 2026, give or take, everybody is going to have it. And we're not going to change how that's going to happen except to keep the, the skids under them. But we're not going to change fundamentally how we're going to deliver this. Uh, and I think nobody at this stage wants to go back into policy and I com compliment the chair for the work that he did on that and for delivering fibre rather than 30 meg, which was a major victory against the naysayers. Uh, rural transport, this again is fair, you know, the theory is fine. So they gave us two new bus connects serving the Connemara region. One going from Anchaharua to Clamaris, and the other going from Anchaharua to Clifton, and there's another one going from Clifton to, Lina, uh, to, to Westport. So I say, yippee, we've got three service day each way, we'll take that as a start, not too bad, except one problem. Coming from Dublin, as I do, bus stops were a few hundred yards apart. I asked them how far apart are these bus stops. Some of them are over 14 kilometres apart, so you'd have to take, for older people, you're not going to cycle there and you're unlikely to walk there. And that's once you get to the main road. That's once you get to the main road. You might be down a boat in another distance. And we have a great ability to have the great policy. But I spend my life on delivery, delivery, delivery. And, and on that, Deputy O'Queen, uh, Louise Lennon can tell you that that's not happening just in rural areas, but it's happening in the town of Athlone, which has been designated to grow as a city, where there's different hubs for, for different connections. Uh, do you want to bring in the witnesses? Um, who wants to, to come in first in relation to that, Ms Bennett? Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you, Deputy. Um, just in relation to, to housing, um, particularly your reference to the, the Cree Conaghy, absolutely welcome for those for whom it works, um, but there are issues with, again, the implementation of it. So, you know, th there are upfront costs, there is a lack of bridging finance to be able to actually access it, because you need to have the property to be able to do it up and then get the, the, the rebate back. Um, so there, there is a review necessary in relation to the implementation of that to make it more effective and to be able to kind of broaden its, its remit, I suppose. Um, in relation to the, the, the energy, um, and the, my colleagues I'm sure will talk about the, the fuel poverty, um, for those again who can afford to put in solar and who can retrofit, um, there are again SEAI grants that are very valuable. Um, but for those who don't fit within the very narrow um, definition or, or eligibility criteria um, of the, the kind of the, the, the social homes one, 
there are still upfront costs that can be 35 to 50,000 in retrofitting that many households just can't afford. Um, so that again, there needs to be, it's, it's back to implementation, there needs to be a review of, of how you can make that more accessible to people who desperately need it. Um, in relation to the uh, the, the um, rural transport, I mean, again, and, and Louise probably will say, <laughs> you know, that there's, there's many things to discuss, but certainly, you know, my colleague here, he came on the bus, I came on the train um, this morning because the time was right. The time of this committee was right. I have sat in other committees that sat in the afternoon or the evening and I've had to drive from Athlone because there isn't a, a train that'll get you back past 20 past seven and there isn't a bus until 10 o'clock. Um, so it's, it's again, it's about that implementation. It's about building on what has been done um, and making sure that it is accessible, that there aren't people being left behind because of, of the gaps that exist in terms of, of what is there, um, so that there, there is a broader spread. I mean, I've been arguing that one for 30 years. Uh, I remember one night being on Vincent Brown and he asked me why I didn't take the train. And I said, well, there's no train to Cardamona. Why don't you take the bus? I said, there's no bus to Cardamona. Game, set, match. Now, the other reason I never took the train, uh, amongst many, was that after seven o'clock in the evening, I don't think there's any train to Galway. No. Nice. So forget it. No, but these are all practical issues. That's what I'm talking about, exactly what I'm talking about. Most of the snags we as politicians say are not the high level goals. I remember saying to the Secretary General of the Department who came in, and we were started at the same time, I said, what you're going to find is the devil's in the detail all the time. The high level stuff's awfully easy. We might get Ms. Look. Carmody to come in on, on that. Yeah, um, thank you very much for your contribution, Deputy. Um, so, uh, zooming out a little bit to that high-level perspective, um, upon looking at the strategies of the Department of Social Protection and the Department of Rural Community Development, there's no evidence that the Sustainable Development Goals have been used from the outset in order to address the various policies that have, have been, or the various issues that the policies raised have been um, designed in order to address. If the questions were asked at the outset around how is somebody who's disabled going to cope with a 14 kilometre gap in between bus stops, that's when that might be ameliorated. But after the fact, it's it's too late. And if you look at both of the strategies, Triple there's... Triple should have told you, come on, you don't need a yeah, massive... No, no, we don't. We're, we no, don't need a massive yeah. sustainable guidelines to tell us. Any we have a number of witnesses that, that want to come in and, and yeah. we have all the business that we need to get through before 12 o'clock. Ms Carmody, without interruption. Yeah. Just to, to finish, um, what we're advocating is for the SDGs to be used as a policy framework so that uh, people don't fall through the gaps and are left, aren't, and so are not left further behind. Um, if we don't do that, we're going to continue having these frustrating conversations that are very practical in their nature, but could have been remedied by that uh, perspective from the outset. The SDGs are not another add-on. They're not another strategy or another policy. They are the overarching umbrella that needs to inform all policies from now on. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Louise Lennon, followed by John Watch. Louise. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Deputy O'Quee, for his comments there. Um, I, I'll just come in on, on some of the transport points. And, yeah, like, as, as Megan said there, you know, the SDGs should be used as that overarching arching, um, framework, I suppose, for our policy design. And, you know, the Connecting Ireland um, piece... The, um, the, the work that's been done on that, like we, like that, we do welcome the, the the rollout of the local link services and the increase. But I know, I know, um, my co our our CEO was in in with this committee a few weeks ago with two local link providers, and um, you know, a lot of the issues they've raised are around that. I suppose bridging that gap between. Where, where there is, um, where a service ends and another one begins, I suppose, and, and, and connecting literally the, the, the services together. Um, I suppose we're currently doing a piece of work with Social Justice Ireland around um, just 
transition and well-being in rural communities and you know transport has come up and it continues to be the main barrier for a lot of of to access a, a lot of other services but some of the issues are some of the the factors that i suppose would increase it is is having that i suppose that last mile mile piece of transport which could be delivered at a more local level through community car scheme or that uber style you know to get that person from their home to um to the bus stop or or the the, the train station or which, whichever is closest to them but and even to the the local link bus stop if it's not a, a door-to-door service um and also you know even the park and ride like even you know even in in towns the the train stations the the parking facilities aren't um big enough to to cater for many many days for 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 people who want to use the train so that's that's another issue then that 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 um can cause you know disincentivizes people to to use use the public transport service that is available to them um and also again having those facilities for local area for the local link services as well it, it, it is needed um you know like if connecting ireland is going to connect it has to connect people and it has to connect make sure that those people who are furthest behind those older people people with disabilities who can't make that journey to the bus stop or the you know by walking or by bike that that they have the choice they have an option there to to have transport available to them thank you Thank you. Uh, John, uh, you might come in there now, John Walsh, and, and just if you could maybe keep the committee updated on that uh, second iteration of the uh, UCC housing report, the committee would be very anxious to get uh, a copy of that report and a briefing as soon as it is uh, completed. Uh, so John Walsh, and then the final contributor is truly, you're going to get the last word. John. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, first of all, I'd agree with Deputy O'Keefe on the land bank on islands. I know at the moment we're actually looking at um, a farm that's up after coming up for sale on Bear Island, and the community is on board with it. And we think if we could buy it, um, it could be used for a number of things. We need a community centre, we need um, child care, as I stated earlier, um, plus we could have um, social housing, plus affordable housing, plus sites that people could actually purchase because it's very difficult to purchase a single site. But I, I approached the council and while I got a very nice email back, it was kind of just showing all the problems. And I think sometimes the local authority needs, needs to show leadership um, and, and instigate these things. A lot of times they're waiting for the islanders to to do it. And then we're, we're, there's roadblocks being put in our way, which um, is very frustrating. Um, the other side of it is um, the rural transport. Like I'm on the board of Local Link Car, and I think the National Transport Authority, while they're a great organisation and they provide a lot of resources, I think they have too much say and too much authority in delivery of local services. And I think the board of, of any Local Link should be um, in a much better position to um, say where stops should be, where routes should be. Um, also, we are one of four Local Links that provide our own buses, and we create employment for people on C schemes and, and RSS schemes um, as bus drivers. It makes the service very adaptable um, and it looks like that it's not really favoured. I think um, the National Transport Authority seem to want to go down the route of, um, you know, subbed out services or, or tendered services, which we don't agree with. Um, the last thing then is Fiverr to Islands, and I actually spoke to um, the chair here today, Dennis, yesterday in, in Clare Island. and. We were discussing this, and he was saying when uh, rural electrification came, they actually put a socket and a light into each house, and that was it. And then they discovered down the line that you could actually cook food with electricity, you could wash clothes with electricity, you could have outside lighting with electricity. And then they actually uh, brought that in. And it's the same. If we don't get fibre to every house in Ireland, which should be the case, we're always going to be up against it. Like I've dealt with Aircom over the years, and I've done a deal with Aircom to upgrade the exchange of Ireland from dial-up to broadband. That lasted for about three years, and then it, it was um, the speed wasn't good enough anymore. I tried to do a deal with them again to lay a cable, but because of national broadband uh, plan coming in, 
they weren't able to deal with us because we were one of the 300 houses and that was in that deal. Um, but I think fibre to the islands has to happen and we've seen what is possible in Clare Island yesterday with the different technologies for e-health. Um, there's a huge world out there but we need to have the proper connectivity for the, all of rural Ireland, but especially the islands, I think. So thank you, Chair. Trudy. Yeah, just just quickly to to kind of give a kind of practical example of, and I totally agree with some of the comments that have been said that, first of all, the SDGs, they're not just environmental, but there's also a social economic aspect and that it's, they're interconnected and therefore like collaboration between the different silos is required. <clears throat> One example from my previous life, I'm originally from Finland, where we did a research benchmarking uh, how cities um, and city planning and development. And there was one example from the Netherlands where they have actually changed the whole organization, uh, which they told was very pay painful, but very fruitful from road, housing, education, services to area specific with representation from each sector. Um, maybe that's something to consider. Uh, but just an example on, on like how um, progress on all of these goals is needed, especially for like for the offshore islands, like example of um, myself. In the lucky case, if I could buy um, um, land on the island with the current uh, holiday home prices, um, and I could get a grant to refurbish uh, derelict house um, I'm also in a situation where if I had children and wanted to start a family on the island, I wouldn't have childcare for the full time. So I'd need to decide whether I stay at home or my partner would stay at home. And that's obviously impacts the income level of that family. I would do this knowing that when my children are 12, I either need to leave from the island because there's no secondary school education on the island, or I'd need to pay 100 euro a week to a stranger to take care of my child on the mainland with the grant, or establish a whole other household on the mainland and live separate and have like two pl places for one family. Uh, and also for the transport currently, um, I don't have a car. Um, we don't have a public service, um, public transport service on, on Inish Boffin, for example, because it's just way too expensive and non-viable because of the insurance um, perspective, because the tourism season is um, limited at the moment. So thankfully I have good neighbors who help me help me out, but every time I need to go and do the so-called big shopping, um, in Clifton I pay 50 euros to go there and back um, for, for in total for the ferry and taxi. So these are all, all things are, are, are linked, but hopefully uh, with some collaboration and some of the things that, for example, Jamin O'Keefe mentioned, um, these could be solved in the future.